Praise God. All right. Well, this morning, it's been a wild week, hasn't it? Yes. Wow. And uh, it's been a good week, but a wild week. And uh, uh, I, I, it's Sunday, and you know you know that God's t- God really um, touched something in the spirit realm last Sunday. Yes. And I, I felt the effects of it because all the crazies came out on Monday. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's always interesting when that happens, you know. Um, but we we really touched something in our worship, and we were touching something this morning as well, as we were declaring life over not just our city but our nation today, right? Um, unfortunately, our culture took a step toward death this week, and I was very very grieved by that. And uh, you know, often we we, you know, I've been talking you know, all throughout the month of January about what our values are as a ministry, amen, and, and one value that I didn't touch on, but we're going to touch very strongly on today, and you're going to hear from several people today, is that we are a place that believes very much in life, we believe very much in caring for the orphan, and you know, we've shared some of the places that we give to even financially every month, one of those is Shores of Grace, and Nick and Rachel Billman, and Emily shared about that, and another ministry that we give to on a regular basis, and many of you know Raj and Colleen Mamidi, and Raj spoke a few weeks ago in our Supernatural School, as they've established a work in India to care for orphans, and they have Impact India. That's another work that we give to on a regular basis as well. But we're, you know, and, and, and as, I, as I navigate my way through this message today, and even though it has a lot to do with obedience and God's heart, um, I don't want it to be a message of condemnation, right? And even as we deal with issues like abortion in our nation and, and some of those things, I, I just want to cl- frame it with the reality that those who have participated in abortion or maybe had an abortion, the love of the Father is big enough. The love of the Father is big enough to forgive and cleanse and heal. And so I don't want these to be things of condemnation, right? But we must be people that, um, I got pretty riled up on social media and I tried to be nice this week, but at the same time, um, you know, we, we as the church, we've got to do more than just point out what's wrong. We have to be people that roll up our sleeves and give real solutions. Right? We, we have to do that. And uh, so this morning, I'm going to talk about God's heart for the unborn and the orphan. Amen. And we're going to hear from a few people. And so just bear with me as I navigate this. I don't talk a lot about social issues, right? But we have to, right? And we have to look at things from a biblical perspective because part of revival involves transformation, right? Part of revival and awakening, societies get changed, right? Things like abortion and human trafficking and some of those things, racism, those things should be healed by a true revival and awakening, right? And so if we're, if we're building a revival culture, um, it's going to require more than prayer, That's almost offensive, isn't it? Now, I am in no way devaluing prayer or fasting. Uh, But I want to say something before I jump into these scriptures. But, you know, and I've been reading the last couple of days looking at some passages from Reese Howell's Intercessor. And uh, you can tell that we've looked through this book a lot. It's in pieces. Uh, And Reese Howell's was a guy who got born again in the time of the Welsh Revival and... um, was very, very much um, led into a life of intercession, right? And uh, one of the, some of the principles that God really dealt with Reese about, um, and, and there was a point when he was really believing for a tubercular woman to be healed. It was the first healing challenge he had, right? And God put that burden on him, and he began to become a living martyr where he was like, God, uh, you know, I'll even take the sickness if I have to, which I don't know that I agree with that theologically, but that was the place of intercession that he was in, and and the woman died, 
and, uh, and, and he gained a place of intercession even at that moment. And from that on, as he began to pray for the sick, they were healed. Um, but one of the things that happened when the tubercular woman died was that um, the husband was out of the picture, and, and she left four children who were uncared for. And the Lord began to deal with Reese Howes, and he said, you know, you have this position as a living martyr. And he said, and I want you to be a father to these four children. And, you know, the crazy thing was God had already put a lot of vision in Reese Howes, and he was like, oh, God, how can I raise four children? But the Lord said, no, I'm putting this burden on you. And, um, you know, and, and he said, you know, and uh, he began to walk through this intercession. And um, God began to deal with him that he would have God's nature to love other people's children just as they were his own. And um, uh, he, he said, I am willing for you to be a father through me. This is what he prayed to the Lord. But I cannot do it unless you love them through me so that, you, so that they are not like adop adopted but begotten children. And to do that, you will have to change my nature. Right? I mean, you know, part of intercession in prayer is that we ask God to change our nature. Yeah. 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 Right? And ever been in that place, right? <laughs> yes, we've all been there. But there, there was also this thing of, um, and God taught Reese Howes a principle of intercession that one only asks the Father to do through another what he is willing for the Lord to do through him. I'm going to say that again. One only asks the Father to do through another what he is willing for the Lord to do through him. And that we cannot be effective intercessors and we can pray, oh Lord, meet that need if we are not willing to meet the need. Right? Now that's heavy, but we can't, we can't pray things like, God, stop abortion if we're unwilling to care for orphans. We can't pray, God, mend families and mend society if we're not willing to say, okay, God, I'll, I'll take a child, right? And uh, I know this is heavy, <laughs> but if we don't practically as the church begin to meet some of these needs, we are hypocrites. And, and Reese Howe said, this is the law of intercession on every level of life, that only so far as we have been tested and proved willing to do our thing, a thing ourselves, can we intercede for others? Right? Jesus, example, Jesus said, harvest fields are white. He didn't tell us to pray for the harvest. He said, pray for laborers to be thrust into the harvest. Right? But if we're not willing to be thrust into the harvest, I would venture to say our prayers may not be effective. Now, not everyone's called to go to China or Africa, right? But we're, we're a, to be a kingdom people that if we don't go, we're, we're supporting, we're praying, we're sending. It's the same thing in the realm of the unborn and, and the orphan, right? When Heidi Baker, when she appoints leaders, one of the things that she looks at before they appoint pastors and leaders, she looks at how they do with children and how they interact with children. And because many of the children go to live with pastors in those settings because of the great need and the level of orphans in Mozambique, right? And, uh, and she looks at that because she said, that speaks volumes to me. If a leader can't interact with a child and love them, they probably aren't going to be a good leader. Ouch. Right? Because that's a, that's a value. And... Um, so that is a, a law of intercession. And if you're like, well, I don't know about this theology, Andy. I don't know. But when you talk about intercession, Christ is our intercessor because he took the place of each one he prayed for. Right? He took the place of each one of us, and he lived in intercession. You know, when, when, um, when I reread Reese Howes a few years ago, I was so aware that Heidi Baker herself was living a life of intercession. 
Heidi's doing all these big crusades, and the Lord said, I want you to go sit with the poor. Because she had to go identify with them. Right? And, and we could talk a lot about her life. You know, I, I've read a lot about Heidi and, and what they're doing, but, uh, but there, there's something of intercession when we identify with those that we're praying for. So, now, just a, just a few scriptures on uh, the unborn. Okay? And, and last Sunday, and we didn't get to say a lot of, about it because, you know, Wayland was here, but last Sunday was actually Sanctity of Life Sunday. And I want to give you just a few scriptures um, about the unborn because we have to have a biblical definition of life. Okay? Um, Job 10.10. 10. And I, I love what um, the New Living Translation, how uh, it translate this and it says you guided my conception and formed me in the womb right it's God who guided conception um, Psalm 139 13 right it says you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb right that actually happens at two months right, in the development process um, Proverbs 20, 12. I know you guys, I'm going to go through a lot of scripture today, so just hang on, okay? Um, Proverbs 20, 12, all, and this one actually is from the NIV, says, Ears that hear and eyes that see, the Lord has made them both. Right? That happens from three to six months in the womb. The Lord is shaping us in, the, in, in, our, in our conception and our, our development. Um, Psalm 71, 6, you have been with me from my birth, from my mother's womb, you have cared for me. Okay. And finally, Psalm 127, 3, children are a gift from the Lord, they are a, re a reward from Him. Okay. Sometimes we may not feel like that every moment, hallelujah, right? But those are just some things about the, un un the unborn. Now, let's talk about, I want to talk about God's heart for the orphan. And, and as I say some of these things, obviously we have an adopted child. And um, I am always very careful when I talk about these things because it is never my desire to use her life as a platform or a cost. And, and even as we talk about some things this morning, and Jamie will share possibly some things later, but um, there are just certain things we're going to guard to protect her privacy. Because she's our daughter, right? And, uh, and I will testify that the grace of God is sufficient for you to love an adopted child as much as one that is your begotten child, right? And I'll be honest as well, when we got her, I was scared. I was scared. She looked like a little sumo. She was so fat. Right, rolls of fat, and um, and I was like, "What are we gonna do?" You know, and, and you, but the Lord is good to change your nature, right? And she's my girl, and I love her as much as my natural children, right? And it's amazing how the Lord can really, really do those things. So I want to look at God's heart for the orphan. Some scriptures here, because how many of you realize that, man, the Word is full of instructions about God really cares for abandoned people. There are numerous, numerous scriptures about the poor, about the abandoned, about widows, about the orphaned. And even in, even in Israel, God would make s certain specific things to care for orphans and widows, you know. I mean, things like, you know, you can tend the land for six years, and then on the seventh year, you don't grow anything, but leave it, and stuff's still going to grow, and it's for the orphan and the widow, and, you know, so that they, you know, those things were set out because God really, really cared, and he really had great concern. Deuteronomy 10, 18. Deuteronomy 10, 18. And again, I'm going through some of these fast, but it says, He ensures that orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. Right? 
Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6. Father to the fatherless, defender of widows, this is God who dw whose dwelling is holy, and God places the lonely in families. Right? God, God loves family. Um, even Jesus, right? And, and adoption is a, a powerful picture of what Jesus has done for us. Right? Because Jesus said in John 14, 18, I will not abandon you as orphans, but I will come to you. Amen. Because you guys, we weren't in the family of God. We weren't. Now Jesus died so that we could all be included. Right? But we're still, we were still orphans until Jesus said, Hey, I have not abandoned you, but I've come to you. Come into my house. Come sit at my table. There were a few months ago I was up here praying, and I, I literally began to see the table of the Lord. And it, it, the love that came from that encounter was so powerful. My context was that, you know, the Lord was dealing with me about competition. I'm just being honest, y'all. Has anybody ever been a minister and felt competition? Yeah, because if you haven't, you're lying. <laughs> it's true. And the Lord said, there's so much room at my table. He said, if you knew how much room was at my table you would never fight or be in competition with anyone. But how much more for each one of us? Man, it is a table that He has set for us where there's so much room. We don't have to live as orphans. Not only in provision and family, but in the Father's love. Right? He's, the Father's love is so great that He set a table for us. He even set it in the presence of our enemies. That's even better. Right? That's an awesome thought. Right? Well, that's a whole other sermon. But, <laughs> so, so Jesus Himself has said, hey, I've invited you into the family. Even though maybe you're orphaned, even though maybe you have issues, even though you've probably got some lack and some character problems, come sit at the table. Come sit with me. I'll work with you. Because I love you. I'll change your nature. Because I love you. But first, I'm not abandoning you. Come on. Right? And so that is a picture of the Father's love. And it's a picture of what He wants to do through our lives. Right? Now, I want to look at Isaiah 58. Incredible scripture. Incredible passage. Um... And it's really interesting because it's in the context of God's people fasting and praying. And yet, God calls them out in their hypocrisy. And He says, okay, you're fasting, you're praying, but I'm not so concerned about your prayers and your fasting Again, y'all, I believe, I mean, I, you know, Reese Howe's intercessor, right? You can tell, right? I value that. Um, I believe we should all be doing that. I think one of the greatest sins of the church at this moment is prayerlessness, okay? But there's more than prayer. That almost sounds sacrilegious, doesn't it? There's got to be an element of action and obedience that comes with our prayer. So I don't want to read all of this, but basically God's correcting His people. And He says in Isaiah 58, verse 6, He says, Is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free? It, is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked, 
to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. I can't think of anyone that is more homeless and destitute than an orphan. Right? God desire, God's desire is action, not just prayer. Now, if you look, he talks about this, and then he says, if you do these things, okay, in verse 8, then, as a result of the actions in the previous verses, then your light will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Right? There's a fast, yeah, there's a fast of prayer and fasting, but God's fast is, I want you to take practical action. Now, again, it's the leading of God how we will do those things. Right? God may ask me to do something that he would never ask you to do. Right? That's between you and the Lord. I don't want this to be a thing of conviction, but if we're going to address the realities of the devastation of abortion, which is now the, one of the major causes of death in the earth today, then we must address this issue, right? And, uh, and I know this isn't a very ooey-gooey sermon this morning. Right? As Jamie said, we're not in an ooey-gooey world at the moment. Right now, in response, many states are rising up and saying, once you detect a heartbeat, you can't abort the child. Right, which some have prophesied years ago. Chuck Pierce prophesied that he sees the rights of states becoming more and more important in the days ahead, and that he saw like a, a civil war breaking out. And I don't think that's literal, but spiritual. Are we in a time of great division in our nation? Right? Do, do we want Oklahoma to rise up in righteousness and not hypocrisy? Right? Uh, so we, we've got to be those that practically meet some of these things. Now, uh, verse, let's look at verses 10 through 12 right, of Isaiah 58. And if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness, and the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones and you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And it says in verse 12, uh, And those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age-old foundations. God gave me this word when I was about 19 or 20 years old. And I was praying about, God, what have you called me to do? And he gave me this word, and he gave me this word for my life and for this city, that he would restore things that were lost. He said, you will raise up the age-old foundations and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. Now, one translation, that I believe it's in the New Living Translation, says you will be known as a restorer of homes. Right? There's got to be a restoration. There, there are children without homes. Right? Now, that's a big word, a restore of homes, right? We as the body of Christ are called to do that and, and see family and all those things happen. But adoption is a wonderful way to see restoration come. Now, you may say today, that's awesome, right? And we're going to hear from some people in just a minute on how you can practically meet these needs. Because here's what we do in the body of Christ. We get convicted and we say, well, sister so-and-so is perfect to do that, but not me. We do that. I do it. Right? And again, you know, we all are in different places in our lives. Not all of us will be like, oh, I can adopt. Not all of us say, oh, I can foster. Not all of us can do that, but some of us can or there, we'll talk about practical ways we can do this. But let's just look and see what the Word says. Okay? Proverbs 21, 13. Okay? And keep in mind, now, this sermon is not a political sermon. But it deals with the political arena. Okay? Because this is a political issue in our country right now. 
And uh, I know it's easy to get angry at politicians, but pray for mercy for them as well. Pray for God to deal with them as well. Proverbs 21, 13, those who shut their ears to the cry of the poor will be ignored in their own time of need. Oh my goodness. Those who shut their ears to the cry of the poor will be ignored in their own time of need. That's a great faith promise, isn't it? Anybody ever confess that? <laughs> Proverbs 28, 27. Whoever gives to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to poverty will be cursed. Now, here's the problem. Sometime in the church, we've turned all this over to the government. And I, I'm, I praise God when we have righteous governments and we have government programs that are designed to help people. But because in the church we've relinquished so much to the government and we've been unwilling to step in and do it, um, I, I actually think it's hindered us and it's hindered the blessing that God wants to flow from our lives and from the church and this nation. Now praise God for what the church does do. I heard a statistic when we were in Guatemala that if missionary organizations pulled out of Guatemala, that that nation would literally go under. Their infrastructure would collapse because of the level of giving that goes into that nation. I would say that's probably true of other nations as well. I mean, I, I would venture to say that's true of Haiti. Those of us that went to Haiti, don't you think that would be true? Right? Right? Uh, so, but, but there's something that, and here's a promise, if you give to the poor, you will lack nothing. I know some of you give every month to children in Haiti. That's a promise you can stand on. I will lack nothing. Right? As we as a ministry have sought to give, to places like Shores of Grace and Impact India. Those are in, in the times we give to the Grace Place, Grace Center. I've got to get those mixed. Uh, the Grace Center here in town. I, I just believe the promise of God that because we're giving to the poor, we will lack nothing. Right? Praise God. And then, I'm not going to read all of this because I want to get to some testimonies, but I, I would encourage you guys to read Matthew 25. Let's just go ahead and turn there, and let's look at part of this. And of course, not, not a warm, fuzzy scripture, but it's about the sheep and goat nations. Right? And he's separating nations one from the other. And, and you know what separated a sheep nation from a goat nation? Was those that saw the king and he was hungry and they gave him something to eat and they were thirsty and they gave him drink. and they, there was, He was a stranger and we invited him in. Naked and you clothed him. He was sick and you visited him. He was in prison and you came to him. Right? And they're like, God, when did we, Jesus, when did we see you? And he goes, that was me. When you did those things. And again, I'm not trying to, to talk about just works, but works are actually really important. They're really important because we become hearers only if we don't move in these realms. And we're not doers of the word. Right? And... and you know, even in these passages of Scripture, and I'm not trying to interpret these things, but, you know, when the, in, in 45 and 46, he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Right? Our faith without works is dead. So, in, in this whole thing, we, we really have to give practical solutions. 
Will Hart prophesied to us years ago, and I, I, I hate to even say this because it convicts me. Because how many of you know, and, and we've had some amazing words from amazing people. We're, we're trying to step into so many things that God is asking us to do. Will Hart was here and he said, I see you guys someday with um, homes for single mothers and their children. And I just wanted to say, no! <laughs> I can't do everything that he's asking me to do. Right? But there's still a vision, and it may, not be, it may not be at this moment, but it's something that we must have vision for, right? It's something that God's putting in our heart and that we have to do. And, uh, um, you know, but, but God wants practical realities. He, you know, and at this time, I just want to have some people who have adopted children just to share about God's heart. So first, I want Dina and James Phillips to come on. And I said Dina because I think she's going to be the spokesperson, right? James was really shy yesterday, and I said, well, just come on up and be the eye candy, you know? <laughs> you didn't know I was going to say that, did you? Right? Well, this subject is very near and dear to my heart, um, not just because I work for the Department of Human Services, but because um, in my own family, I have had 18 nieces and nephews come in and out of the foster care system. And of those 18, um, 17 of them have been adopted. And so um, very, very um, near to my heart, this subject. Uh, James and I have adopted three of those. And um, while we say, you know, we didn't adopt those, though they adopted us, they have changed our life forever, um, especially Brianna. <laughs> Brianna, as if you haven't got to meet her, she's full of love and just um, such a special little girl, and she really has changed us. So adoption is very important because no child deserves to live in the foster care system and not have a forever home. Every child deserves to be loved and to have a home that shows that love. Um, so very important. And as Andy said, there are some things you can do that you don't, if you can't adopt or foster, you can help these homes. Um, of course, you can pray for them. But you can also offer to babysit. You can offer to be a respite where if they have a weekend that they need to get away, you can do that. You can take them meals, you know, um, help them cook. Their schedules are very busy. There are a lot of things you could do. You could offer rides for the children for sporting events or things that they need to do. So there are a lot of things that you can do if you yeah. can't foster or adopt. Yeah. So has adoption changed your life? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we raised um, our three biological children. We always said, oh, by the time we're 40, we're going to be done. We'll have an empty nest. And God said, no, <laughs> you're yeah. doing it again. Right. So absolutely. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. Thank you. Is that awesome? That's so awesome. Thank you, guys. Now I want my wife to just come and share whatever's on her heart about adoption, even if it's just part of our story. I don't I don't even know what part of our story to share. We kind of just always lived our life as this crazy intercession, and it was something that um, adoption was always something that was in my heart as a young person and Andy as well. Before we even knew each other, we knew it would be part of our our married journey, um, and we actually. And I know even separately, I know when I was young, there was something, and I was like, you know, I want to have a couple of kids, and then I want to adopt. It was just something that God put in our hearts separately before we ever even knew each other. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what order we would we would do it in. I didn't really have an order in life. I just knew I was going to be a mama, and that's all I had planned. And um, <laughs> I thought that would be good enough. But, um, but yeah, I just, you know, it was just something when we actually tried to go the adoption route many different times, and the Lord just kept saying, wait for just a moment. But there were ways that we really gave and, and were a part of other people's lives who were, were on that journey. Um, but when we were in the nation of Japan, that's when God said, it's time. It's time, and, and I want you to do something. And, and in that time in Japan, it was even a time where you couldn't adopt internationally from Japan. You you could only, so we didn't do an international adoption. We lived there. So it was in the nation, and um, it became a great intercession, and that's a whole other story. But there were just nights as we had, had applied to adopt within the nation and all of those things. Um, 
I would just wake up in the night and I would just go sit in this nursery that we had had created for this child that we knew was coming to us. We didn't know who, when, it, him, it, her. And it was a prophetic act. It was just a prophetic act of, of something. To, and um, I would just wake up in the night and I would just go sit in there and I would just declare life, life, life. Jesus, you bring life to this child. You and just, just crying out for life to sustain whatever child he was he had for us and all of the children that were d being aborted in our in that nation because that nation the abortion rate is extremely high um you will rarely meet a woman who has not had an abortion in, in japan um and it, and the spiritual dynamic of japan is that there are times and i know that people like peter wagner and cindy jacobs spent a decade sowing into believing for revival in japan and uh, there was a, there's a literal spirit of abortion that worked in the nation that would often prevent moves of God from fully coming into manifestation. And so there was a war against a literal spirit of abortion that not only was seeing children aborted, but would stop moves of God from happening. So we really believe that the Lord was speaking to us that we were to adopt in this nation and that as we would do that, that God was breaking something open in the land itself that would cause others to be able to adopt and it would change the face of adoption in that nation and um, what we later found out sometimes you walk these things out and you pray these things and you live these things and we could have prayed and prayed and prayed but no we needed to take action we had to you know as we laura and i talked the other day put your money where your mouth is and it costs a lot of money you know you'll get over it you will you'll spend money on I, whatever I don't have any more money than you do I don't what do you want to spend it on I'll spend it on a kid all day long you know I'll spend it on a life that will live and breathe and be set free and they will change the world any day that's why I do what I do all day long but um guess what I got a bunch of orphans sitting in my school who actually have parents sorry I mean I'm, I'm looking in the face of several children right now in my school who are basically really orphans, who feel like orphans, who are desolate, and they live with their parents. You got to do something, and it's more than prayer. I can pray for the children of the world all day long, but until I get up and I do something, I say, yes, you can live with me. Yes, I will be your mom, and will you be my child? She changed us. I, we feel the same. She can, She was like the... The icing on the cake for and our family. Let me just say, we love our biological daughters. They're all right. They're we okay. love them. I'm not going to short, shorten or say, short, change them, short yeah. change them in any way. But she's the favorite. Emily says she's the favorite, right? <laughs> yeah, our, our biological girls just would say, oh, our family's complete now. It's like something was missing our entire family, you know, and it, it just changed everything. And and if you know Mia at all, and we, we had her go to Children's Church because we don't want her to feel uncomfortable or be a platform because she is not. I mean, if you know her at all, she is probably the one with the least orphan spirit in our house. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> the rest of us might deal with that, but she does not. You know? She knows. She owns us all. You know? <laughs> but, but there's just something that we have to be people who really do the stuff. You know? And I'm not telling you to go adopt, but like, you know, and I'm sure Laura will talk about some of these things, but oh my goodness, how about pay for some kid to be able to go to school? You know, some of these, these parents who have adopted and fostered, they want their kids to be able to come to school here. How about pay for that? How about, like she said, go give them a weekend off, cook a meal, um, babysit. There are so many things that you can do to help if you're not like you can't come live with I mean I'm not in a place where I can ha take on another child in this moment even though we talked about it we, we have discussed it on many occasions but if you know what our life is right now we're in over our head and we're barely taking care of the children we we have in, in a very <laughs> good manner but um <laughs> but you know what we give our life right here every day you know come sit and read listen to some kids read come do something Put your money where your mouth is. And, and again, you can't pray those intercessions without being willing to be an answer some way, somehow. And you know, God will so work in destiny. 
right, and purpose, and and even when um, the agency came to talk to us in Japan, she actually had, uh, and they were American missionaries, she actually had a different child in that field little boy. service. Mm -hmm. And um, before she came, I was praying because I was really nervous because if you've ever been to like a home study visit, they ask you everything. <laughs> Everything, yeah, and uh, so I'm really nervous. And in Japan, they spend the night with you. Yeah. And so uh, they came to visit, and before she came, I'm praying, and I began to see a vision of this big tree. I had no idea what it meant. I'm just like, well, that's really cool. Here's a vision of a big tree. And so she comes. She does the. She and her husband do the home study visit. They go back. Um, she calls. You the next, told her about the big tree. I did, but I. It was in a different context because I thought the Lord was giving her a word, and I think he is. He was. So she calls Jamie back, and she says, here's the child I really have in mind for you guys. And she began to give Jamie all the details. So after Jamie gets off the phone, I, you know, Jap in, in Japanese language, you have a name, but you also have kanji, the symbols, that mean something. Right? Each kanji has a meaning because it's a picture. And um, Jamie had written down the word, the phrase, big tree. And I said, Jamie, what is this? And she said, well, her name is this and this, but her kanji means big tree. Big tree! <laughs> oh my God. We're like, big tree, big tree, big tree! You know, and we knew that there was destiny and purpose. And uh, she had actually come, as Jamie said, with a different child in mind. But when she met us, she's like, oh, okay, this child is for them. And this child, because this child. Means because of the, the way she was born and the things and the laws of the land, um, she had really held on to Mia in, in her custody. Because there was going to take such a fight through immigration for her to get what she needed. And you don't just do that to anyone. But when she met us, she didn't spend the night with us, anything. Because we knew who we were and we answered the questions. She's like, this usually takes me two days and it took us a few hours. I mean, we're just like, T -t 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 -t. we knew who God said we were. We knew who, what we were doing. We live with purpose. We could answer her questions. You know, even our children had to go through it. And I mean, we bopped right through that. And she was like, you guys will push and you will fight for this child to get what she needs. And so um, so she'd given me all the information. She said, call me back when you guys pray about it. And as soon as we had read Big Tree and we're like, oh, my gosh, I call her back. And I said, her kanji means Big Tree. And, and Sarah said, yeah. And I said, her kanji means Big Tree. And she goes, oh, my gosh. This is your baby. She goes, this is your baby. Because she is so worried to, to place the wrong child with the wrong family. That's a huge decision, right? And she was always just so careful and cautious and so worried about that. She goes, this is your baby. This is your baby. This is the, this really is the match. You know, so, you know, it's just all these little things that God does for you. It, it's, it's a fabulous journey. Um, it's an awful journey. It's wonderful. It's a fight. And, you know, anyone who tells, okay, for, I want you all to start using this when people tell you, you never know what you're going to get when you adopt. You don't know what you're getting when you birth these children. <laughs> Emily was my worst baby. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you don't know. That's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And... No, there are, what, there are dumber stuff. Actually, I could tell you. I could write a book on the dumbest stuff I've ever heard. But anyway. I have to tell one. We had a family Don't friend. Don't let me. Okay, you tell it. So Mia's like, what, four, four or five, five months old, and we're visiting. No, no, no. Four or five. Can't be spoken. <laughs> oh, no, see, that, that's funny. But, um, okay, let me just tell the other one okay, first. Okay. The four or five years old. She was like four or five months old, and we've come back from Japan just to visit. And that's when everybody got to meet her, you know, all of our family. And we go to church with mom and dad in another city. And we're sitting there, and I'm holding her, and this guy comes by and he's like, Is she adopted? She's Japanese. <laughs> and look how, look how white we are. Fish belly white. I'm right. telling you. And so, Is she adopted? And I just looked at him. I said, nope. 
we were just so shocked when she came out. <laughs> he goes, that was a really dumb question, wasn't it? And I said, it was, it was. Okay, but and Annie's then, favorite. this is even better. When Mia's about four or five years old, a family friend asked my mom and asked us one day, she goes, does she speak English? And I said, not a word. It's so hard to communicate with her. The funny thing is, she didn't realize how dumb her question was. Yeah, You're right. she didn't ever figure out. That we, was, yeah. Bless her heart. Bless her heart. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so now, very practically, I want Laura, Laura Phillips just to come. You to follow that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, she did a great job. She did a great job, but let's let's hear from Laura. Yeah, I mean, they, they've been in that place, so they know what, what helped and didn't help right. or what they received and didn't receive. Um, just practically speaking, um, we have, um, here in Carter County, we have an, a, a recruitment team. They recruit foster homes in the state of Oklahoma. And you can call the DHS office, and you can just ask, what can I do? And I'm sure they will give you a wealth of information on what support because they know who their foster parents are and what they need and and that and that sort of thing but there is a, a you know Dina was touching on the babysitting part and we do have what we call a respite foster home program and basically what you're doing is you're just uh, you're kind of adopting a foster home and in, in a sense and you can you I mean you have to go through the home study and be approved and everything background checks and the whole nine yards but you're basically there for when they need you. So if they need they need to go out for the night and, or just go away for the weekend or even a week, you can take care of those children for them. And that is just gives them a break and some reprieve. And it also can open your eyes into the lives of these children. And you can just become um, just kind of a surrogate for that family, in a sense, for those children. So those are just, I mean, those are great, great needs. We have social workers who are killing themselves driving across the state. Uh, Dina is absolutely one of them. And Can just... Explain why she's having to drive across the state. She's having to drive. That's, that's what I was going into. All right. Sorry. <laughs> um, the reason is, is because we don't have local foster homes in Carter County. We have a lot of people who live in Carter County, but we don't have very many foster homes at all. And I'm talking about traditional foster homes, people who take in children who are not related to them. And so we have to find homes that may be Tulsa, Ida Bell, you know, up in the panhandle, and uh, people who will take kids. And a lot of times, if you remove like a, a set of siblings, like three children, two children, four children, or more, and sometimes it's five or six, <laughs> um, unfortunately, we rarely can keep those kids together. So not only are they losing their parents, they're losing their siblings. And so we're, sp yes, they, they lose their whole community, their best friends, their, their teacher that was their safe haven, that classroom that was always that safe haven for them while they were going through the abuse and neglect. So then they, they lose that, you know, those siblings and that support system that they knew of, and then, you know, just the price that a social worker pays just to make sure that those siblings can stay connected and see each other. And so they are, you know, right now in our state, we're promoting weekly visitation with children and their parents so our parents will you know connect to that responsibility these are my kids and I need to do what I need to do to get them back and so yeah that that's just a reality of what's going on and so if our community could take responsibility over our children just even in just Ardmore just the amount of support that that would provide for the work that they are doing and the work that they're doing in the trenches it would just, it would speak volumes. And I, I really believe it would heal our society because they would just feel and see their support. And not only the kids, but the parents. The parents need people in their lives, good support people, because all they know are their friends who they do drugs with. So they need a good, responsible, um, 
support systems, people who can speak into their life, can pray with them, can show them the right way and the right direction and be invited at church, you know, and there's, there's such a stigma. There is such a stigma for people who are down and out and going through, um, you know, who are in domestic violence situations and are using drugs and the church sometimes is the last people that they want to turn to. And I was, I was even, and this is kind of on a different subject, but not. I am a mother and a sister to an Edwin and what mother. The shame did not come from the world and unsafe people. The shame came from the church. And I saw it take a hold of their life over the years and down to their children. My own daughter, when we had a baby shower for her, nobody from her church came. And it was it was hard. It was really, really hard. And we've gotta we've gotta change our hearts. We have to ask the Lord, break my heart. Break my heart, Lord, for what breaks your heart. So I can have the heart and the strength to do every one of these practical things that we're talking about. We have to love them where they're at. It's okay to be where we're at. When I came here this morning, I am in a place, a really dark place. I was going to say, this was really, really brave for Laura to do this today. I'm not going to go into all the details, but I'm in a really hard place. And so it's hard to be vulnerable. It's, it's hard to, um, when you don't feel it, and God accepts you where you're at. It's okay if you're not jumping up and down, and just come to where you're at, and people need to to do that. They need to come into your life and be where they're at and be accepted and loved. And I do feel accepted and loved this morning even though I'm where I'm at. So, I don't know if there's anything more you needed me to share. but I think you knocked it out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amen. Thank you. Yes. But that is the reality of, of those things because of the shame and because of the those things that come with some of those things, that's why abortion is often chosen, you know, and, and it's not, I, I've had girls come into my school before and come and sit and talk to me because they've been shamed out of their public school system. They can't come back or their parents won't let them, you're, you know, and um, they're like, what am I going to do? I want to at least get a high school diploma. And I, I just look at them and I say, first I want to say to you, thank you for not aborting your baby and being brave to, to do this. Thank you for that. Now, we're going to get you your high school diploma, and we're going to get you through this. They don't necessarily come to school here, but I walk with them for anywhere from six months to two to three years, depending on where they are in that system of, of a high school. And there's one girl who we, we got her diploma and got her into college. Um, she now, and she wouldn't care if I told her. She works where Mia gets her eyes checked, and um, she's just blooming. I just love to watch what she's doing, and you know what? Her daughter has kept her on the straight and narrow, you know, and because she, she loves her daughter that she had in great shame, but and she was shamed out of some really great schools around here, but um, just what she's doing now, you know, because she was able to keep moving forward, and there's just so many dynamics to that, and, and you still have purpose, and you still have destiny, and you still have to keep that focus of what God has called you to do, and you're doing amazing things, and God is using you greatly, and he's not finished, and you're going to continue what he put in your heart. You will see fulfilled, and you will do all of those things in Jesus' name, and you've changed more lives than you will ever know. You've changed more lives than you will ever know. You are the reason so many are where they are today. Those two right there for one thing. Um, you know what? It's just a just had to step on a different path. 
but the, the redemption that's going to come from that and the fruit that you're going to see because he works all things together for your good even in the midst of demonic crap. You know what? You're not forsaken. If it's not a fun moment, but he's putting you on, uh, yeah, he puts you on a different path, but oh my gosh. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're going to see the fruit on a whole new level. You're going to see the fruit of your labor at a whole new level in a very quick time period. Amen? Amen. 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 So let Laura know that you love her. Okay? Jamie. Jamie. Is this okay? Can we be family? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this morning when I was back there in powerful worship, it was clear to me that the Lord was speaking to people who were truly in the midst of battle, truly being overwhelmed and wondering how they could hold their position and, and stand up under the onslaught that's coming at them and uh, and and you know sometimes it's 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 odd to be in a congregation where you've got those rejoicing and then you see those that are in great great pain and you, it's a dichotomy it's, it's it's a contradiction you think um, you, you can't understand how uh, this happens but we're all all of us at different times in different places under different stresses and under different attacks and everything. So, you know, when it's when 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 it's good, rejoice and love it. And when it's not in then you just know that God's gonna get you through this and God's gonna take care of this. And and I, I was I was thinking, God, how how great is your ability to keep us I mean, we say that, but how how great really is it? Because sometimes you feel like you're, you're just drifting and you can't find a place to hold on to in, in your emotions. And yet my mind is telling me he's able. Yeah. And, and uh, I just saw this picture of the universe just swirling, power, heat, motion, and everything moving at light speed and everything. And the Lord said, with the breath of my word, it keeps its boundaries. Oh my gosh. Can you believe that? With the breath of his word, all that keeps its boundaries. And he said, even if a nation of demons raised up against you, they wouldn't be able to put one finger on you. How powerful is that? That the Lord, that the enemy had designed a nation against you. And the whole nation couldn't raise one finger against you. And, 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 that, and, that, and that's just not how big he really is and how powerful he really is. But we need to understand, I, you know, I'm back there and I'm seeing my daughter walking, weeping. I know she's going through it. And, and I don't know what to say because she knows I love her. But I, w I want to say something that counts, not, oh, honey, I know you're going through this, and I love you and everything. And, and yeah, but I want a word that sets her heart free. I want a word that melts all that off of her. And I didn't have it, but I felt like I do now. Can you receive that? That, that, that? that what you're going through, God is able to keep you. Not only that, you will prosper. You will grow. You will be better for it. How impossible that sounds. But it's true. God is able to do that. And so I just want you to be encouraged. Those of you who are going through something right now, and, I, and you know, I'm on the tail end of it. I'm starting to really feel better now. I, I went through my own little dark pat, patch, you know, and uh, I got put on the spot yes, uh, yesterday on, on the on the breakfast, but you know what? It was God's ambush. God ambushed me. Yeah. And, and Dwayne was just a willing partner. 
to, to ambush me. But you know what? I needed to voice it. God said, you need to get this out and let people know you're going through stuff. And, and, that, and, that, uh, and that, you know what? No matter what you're going through, I shared one little, little, little illustration. I know I'm taking time. But uh, we've been on space lately, and I was watching different movies and stuff. And, and I remember uh, somebody was saying, you know, how, how much of the time do you think when they sent the rocket to the moon, how much of the time do you think the rocket was actually on target? You know, you know I thought, well, 70, 80 percent of the time, I don't know. And, and, and they said less than 5% of the time. The rest of the time was all correction. And, and the Lord said to me, Dean, I'm always correcting. You're on target. You're just not perfectly on target, but I'm correcting you. You're not off target. So I realized, you know what? Why don't, I, I'm okay. I'm okay. I don't feel like I'm right on the mark. But you know what? I'm going there. And I'm going to get there. But then I know that I'm going to get some correction again. But it's a process. And it's okay. So, you know, where are you? Where are you? Where, wherever you are, give yourself grace. You're not off target. You just, you just need some correction or your guidance or whatever. But you're okay. You're okay because we're in His hands and, we're, and He's taking mm -hmm. care of us. So mm -hmm. let's not fret. But let's surround those that are going through it and, and encourage them. So, anyway, that's it. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Wow, we've said a lot in a short amount of time, I think. But so my my encouragement to you is ask the Lord. What you can do. That's all. Ask the Lord what you can do. And it may require some action. You know what? It may actually inconvenience you. that's okay. We can't cry out for a city to be changed when Dina's driving hours every day. Because no one in our region will meet this need. Because we've shut our ear to the cry of the poor. God help us. Right? And yet, I don't want it to be heavy. We're all convicted, right? <laughs> but ask the Lord what He wants you to do. Amen? It's as simple as that. So, Father, today we want to thank You for Your great love. And Father, I thank You today that, first of all, we can know Your heart, that You're a Father. God, that Your table is big enough, that God, you, you, you're looking for people who will respond and who will be your hands, who will be your feet, who will reveal, reveal your heart to the earth. And so, Father, uh, first of all, we just repent for our nation and some of the things that we've allowed to happen. But Lord, use us to turn the tide. God, I, I believe that there's a determination in your heart for imminent awakening. Not just for this city, but we'll get to be a part of that. But Lord, for this nation. Lord, we thank you for all your promises. And God, we ask you to speak to us. And we ask you individually as families, but also as a body and a church. Lord, use us, Lord, to be a place that restores homes. Whatever that looks like, Father, we thank you. Thank you for your grace, your love your mercy today, God, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, praise God. If you need um, prophetic ministry, we'll have a team of prophetic ministers here to minister. If you need prayer for healing in your body, for physical healing, uh, come and receive prayer from our teams for physical healing. And uh, Amen? Just rejoice. Isn't it awesome that we have babies here and babies coming? And Amen? And uh, so pray for one another, love one another, and have a great day. Amen? Bless you guys. Thank you.